And I think with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome, everyone. Quick disclaimer, the information that's presented today during our event is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice. Rather, we're here to give you information and the resources that you need. Um, please never disregard the professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during our forum. And with that, I would now like to hand it over to our president and CEO, John Boyle, for opening remarks. Well, thank you, Ashley. I appreciate it. And a happy new year to one and all. I uh, hope that everyone here had a, a wonderful holiday season. Uh, and it is phenomenal to see all of you here again tonight. The numbers are just uh, through the roof, uh, which I think really speaks to, uh, of course, the, the great topic and the great presenters uh, that we have here uh, with you. Uh, it, it is so great to see, uh, again, those who have been with us uh, through the pandemic here uh, and, and as part of our community for a long time. But for those of you who are newer and have just discovered us or just discovered our, our forums, uh, know that we are truly grateful to have you here today and we really hope that you get a lot out of it. Um, so on behalf of uh, the entire uh, team at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, uh, welcome to uh, our uh, first really big forum of 2021, COVID-19 Update and Treatment Options. Uh, our team has been uh, working with our presenters, uh, Drs. Ballo and Walter, uh, to provide you with information uh, regarding the status of what we know about COVID-19 uh, and the PI uh, community and how they relate, uh, as well as, of course, treatment options and more related topics. Um, you know, 2020 was a year, of course, that presented um, a lot of challenges to our community, of course, as well as to everyone uh, in the, uh, the world at large. Uh, but it also allowed us to help the rest of the world understand the challenges that uh, those of us with uh, PI face on a daily basis in terms of being cautious and being concerned about risk management and uh, the way that we have interacted with COVID-19 and, and keeping ourselves safe by and large is what uh, a lot of people are now doing. And so I think that we've all seen um, some real, at least interesting silver linings to the ordeal that we've all, all gone through. Um, the information that uh, Dr. Ballow and, and Dr. Walter are gonna talk about here uh, is of course, just the tip of the iceberg. There is uh, so much to be said about COVID-19 and there's so much that we at IDF would like to be able to provide. But uh, as I'm sure they will say, so much of the uh, the situation that we're facing is so personalized and so dependent upon your particular uh, condition, uh, your particular um, uh, factors that may make life even uh, uh, more uh, challenging in uh, potentially dealing with it. Uh, so just know that my team and I, uh, we are getting your questions on a daily basis. Um, we would love to be able to provide uh, more advice and more guidance, uh, frankly, than we uh, have been already. But just as uh, our physician speakers can tell you, uh, you know, so much of this is something that you really do have to discuss with your uh, care team yourself, because uh, you know we are in uncharted waters here, and uh, you know the, the medical community is learning uh, as it goes, and you know they're telling us what they can, uh, but it is uh, it is slow going. And it, this is, of course, uh, we are a very rare group and COVID-19 is still so very new uh, to all of us. And so uh, just know that we will provide information like this as we can, as there are updates, we will uh, uh, be we just on top of uh, sharing it with all of you as best as we can. But we do ask that you are patient uh, and understanding because you know we do have to make sure that uh, we are following the scientists who are following the science ultimately. But uh, with any information that we do have, we will gladly, gladly try to make it as available to you so that you can discuss with your care team uh, what is appropriate in terms of vaccines, in terms of treatments, in terms of all the things that are really coming next. So uh, with all that, I just wanted to kind of quickly mention our mission, uh, you know, and as you can see, uh, what IDF is all about, for those of you who are new, is really fostering a community and that word is very important to us, community uh, that's empowered by education, research, and advocacy. So, uh, you know, our role is to provide you with the tools and resources that you really need to be your best advocate. And we hope that some of what you learn here today and through the rest of our programming will help you with that. 
Uh, one thing that is uh, newer uh, to most of you is a, a vision statement that our Board of Trustees has uh, uh, adopted uh, with us. And so we wanna make sure that you understand really where it is that um, IDF is trying to go and what our real vision for our community is meant to be. And so, um, you know, we do want you to be having that fully informed understanding of all these aspects that you see. And of course, a fully, form, uh, uh, fully informed understanding of COVID-19 as it relates to those of us with PI. So um, thank you for indulging me for a few minutes here. Now I get to sit back and uh, uh, take notes as well because uh, uh, my, my wife has asked that uh, being a patient myself that I make sure that I am providing her with all the information uh, uh, that uh, uh, the doctors are providing uh, just because, uh, you know, this is so much of this is new to all of us and it's so critically important and sharing this information uh, with everyone that we can is, uh, is just part of what it is that we do. So uh, with that, uh, I will hand it over very gladly to my colleague, Ashley. And Ashley, take it away and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, John. And again, thank you to everyone. At this time, I did want to take the time to invite you to another set of upcoming forums that we have this month. Uh, next week on Thursday, January 28th, we do have advocating for your child in today's education settings for grades K through 12. And then we have a Skid Compass Lunch and Learn coming up in February. We do encourage you to come. The more informed you are, the better. Uh, we'd also like to take this time to thank our sponsors for their support. It is because of their support that we are able to provide you with these forums, all of this information. Uh, a special thank you to our 2020 sponsors who we hope will continue to sponsor us in 2021 so that we can continue with these programs and fulfill our mission of providing you with um, the education and the resources you need. The, our sponsors include Core Service Leader CSL Bearing, Griffles and Takeda, our Core Services Supporter, Octopharma, our core service sustainer, Horizon Therapeutics, core service contributor, Lediant Biosciences and Adva Biologics, our national sustainer, Acredo, and our national patron, Diplomat Specialty Infusion, Kedrion Biopharma, CVS Specialty, Quorum CVS Specialty Infusion Services, Coru Medical Systems, Kaba Fusion, and Solia Health. A thank you so much to our sponsors. At this time, I would now like to pass it over to Kelly Gortz from CSL Bearing, who's going to give a quick word from our sponsors. Hi, Kelly. Oh, it's good to go. There you go. All right. Thank you, Ashley and John. Um, good to be back with everyone um, during 2021 here. But my name is Kelly Gertz. I am the CSL representative um, for our IG products of Privagen and Hyzentra. And most importantly, this year, um, we're here to support this entire PI community. So thank you, IDEA, for letting us join these valuable forums. And I am excited to see um, 505 participants tonight. I can see that at the bottom of my screen. And so I am looking forward to hearing Dr. Ballow and Dr. Walter also. But wanted to also let everyone know, um, patients and ca caregivers, um, in our breakout room tonight, we'll be going over all the resources that we have available for Hyzentra and Privagen. And we will also be demonstrating our newest um, Hyzentra pre-filled syringe. So we look forward to seeing everyone in the breakout and thank you again, IDF, um, for bringing this community. I think it's more of a family together through your forums. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Kelly. Next, I would like to invite Kurt Himes from Griffles for a quick word from our sponsor. Hi, Kurt. Hey, good evening. Well, thanks for having us. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we're, we're here this evening to support uh, the IDF and, um, you know, been here for years and uh, through other capacities. I've, I've attended a lot of IDF events throughout the western half of the United States. So, but with Griffles, you know, I'm proud to be here and I've been with Griffles for about three years and really enjoy what we do here. Um, you know, we're a, a global based company that um, enhances the health and well being of patients around the world. And we've been doing that since 1909. So that's uh, pretty, pretty phenomenal. And um, our products help to improve the quality of life for our patients. And, and really, it's for this reason that safety is a philosophy that uh, goes hand in hand. Um, with our commitment to integrity and in everything that we do. And as we talk about support and patient focus, you know, here today, and as Griffles will talk about it later this evening, and if you see us at conferences, hopefully once again, face-to-face, -face, 
you'll see that our, our four main pillars are uh, education, advocacy, engagement, and support. And so we look forward to um, teaching more about our support this evening. And uh, again, just wanted to say thank you so much. And we're proud to be a national sponsor of the IDF. Thank you, Kurt. And now it is my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Mark Fallow uh, from the University of South Florida, who's going to go ahead and present on COVID-19 update and treatment options. Hello, Dr. Fallow. Thank you, Ashley. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. So, um, and I think you can get an idea how horrific this pandemic is. I think the last time I showed a map of the United States, uh, the colors were kind of off white. And obviously the deeper the red, uh, the higher the prevalence or the incidence uh, occurrence of cases of COVID in the United States. And even the data at the top is now is outdated. I think there's over 25 million cases. And as you know, there's been a lot of press about over 400, uh, 400,000 uh, deaths in, in the United States since this started in, in the end of uh, February. So uh, we're gonna cover a little bit about vaccines. I know we did this previously, but there's always questions about the different vac uh, vaccines and what are they and how do they work, et cetera. And then what I did is I prepared some slides from questions that came in through the IDF portal because I anticipate that these will be common questions that will come up tonight. So, uh, so I will hopefully preempt those questions and address them as we, uh, as we uh, go along. Uh, before we get into the vaccines, I just wanna uh, mention there's also a lot of press about the variants of, these, of this virus, the COVID-19. And as you know, uh, the first variant that was recognized actually was originated in the uh, United Kingdom in England, and it's now very prevalent here in the United States. Uh, it's said that the uh, infectivity or transmissibility is, is higher with this particular variant of the virus. It's about twice what the uh, previous uh, variant was. Uh, however, the uh, <clears throat> morbidity and mortality hasn't really changed so it's just the infectivity uh, uh, of, of this particular strain of, of virus. But we anticipate that it's everywhere in the United States. Now you probably heard perhaps and even on the news tonight, there are other variants, one in South Africa and others in South America, particularly Brazil. And those variants are a little bit disturbing because um, they, <clears throat> Uh, the, at least some of the information out of South Africa is that uh, this particular virus can infect somebody, someone twice, even though they mount an immune response. What we don't know is whether this is going to affect vaccine efficacy. It's a little bit too early to uh, tell. And it's also a little bit too early, although there's some concerns that the monoclonal antibodies and the um, <clears throat> plasma, the enriched plasma for COVID-19 antibodies that's been collected um, may be less effective. But, you know, this is still not decided yet. It's still very early. Um, and so I don't want to scare anyone, but uh, we have to be you know, on top of it and, uh, and see what happens when we get more data about uh, these particular variants from South Africa and, and Brazil. So this is the good news. There's a lot of viral, a lot of vaccine uh, uh, research being done. Uh, you can see that there's 41 vaccines in phase one. Um, there's 22 in phase two, uh, which is, you know, uh, phase one and phase two are small groups in humans to, you know, to make sure that individuals can produce an antibody and, uh, and also looking at safety. Uh, there's 20 vaccines in phase three. Um, <clears throat> there's eight vaccines that actually kind of under emergency use are approved in various countries, 
But in this country, we have two that are uh, approved, two vaccines that are currently approved. Um, this is just a, a restatement of what I said before. <clears throat> there are 68 vaccines in clinical trials. 20 have reached final stages of testing. This is around the world, not, not in the United States. This is taking the whole world under consideration. And by the way, you, anyone can get this data. It's, I, I got this from the New York Times. So all you'd have to do is search in the New York Times. It's free. You don't need to have a, a subscription to the New York Times and just put in COVID-19 vaccines and, you'll, and this will come up. So this is a, just a list of leading vaccines. Again, uh, not all these uh, uh, pertain to the United States. And we're just going to mention the, the few that, that do pertain to the United States in the next a few slides. Okay, so I think everyone's familiar with the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, this is an mRNA vaccine. You need two doses, three weeks uh, apart. And uh, the efficacy is very high. It's more than 90%. Um, so this is a vaccine that's available now. Now the shortcoming of this vaccine it has to be stored at very, very cold temperatures, minus 70 degrees centigrade or minus 94 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So this makes it very difficult to distribute throughout the United States because you have to have special facilities uh, in order to keep this vaccine at minus 70 degrees centigrade. Here's a Moderna vaccine that's very similar to the Pfizer. It's an mRNA vaccine. Again, the efficacy is very high in the mid 90s, two doses, four weeks apart. Uh, this one is, uh, as far as storage, is much better. It's stable at six months at, at minus 20 degrees centigrade or minus four degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. And it's also can be stored in, for 30 days in refrigerator without being inactivated. Um, so this one is a little bit easier to distribute in the United States. And in fact, at least in Florida, this has been the major vaccine that's been distributed to the different, uh, uh, different various counties uh, in, in the United States. As you can see also on the bottom of the slide, it's approved in different countries, such as European Union, Israel, Switzerland, United Kingdom, et cetera. Although the Pfizer vaccine was, is also approved in the uh, UK and, uh, and other countries. So these are the two, <clears throat> two vaccines that we currently have available to us in, in the United States. And <clears throat> the next vaccine that may be available actually is, comes from the UK. It's the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that perhaps you have uh, heard about. It's, uh, it's a little bit different than the mRNA vaccines. It's, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's actually uses the DNA from the virus, the spike protein, the DNA from the spike protein of the, of the virus genome, and then uh, uh, packaged in some kind of a vector, uh, which I'll mention in, in a minute. And that's the basis of uh, this vaccine. I hear through the grapevine that this vaccine may come before the FDA uh, shortly, if not by the end of January, perhaps uh, an early part of uh, February. Uh, the slides are a little bit out of, out of um, <clears throat> sequence, but that may be my fault. But just going back to the mRNA vaccines, this, is, uh, uh, this material is the, is the mRNA that will be transcribed into protein that reflects this, uh, the spike protein to which we make antibodies to protect us. And what this mRNA is packaged in these oily bubbles or lipid, what they call lipid nanoparticles. And this is what's injected into the muscle uh, to actually immunize us. And this is just a cartoon to show that <clears throat> once these uh, lipid nanoparticles get inside the cell, uh, the mRNA is tra uh, <clears throat> translated into protein, the spike protein, and then uh, gets out of the cell in which we uh, make antibody. The immune system then makes not only an antibody response, but also a cellular immune response or T cell response. The uh, AstraZeneca is a little bit different as I said before. In this case, you're using the DNA from the virus, the 
particularly the, the sequences that relate to the spike protein. Uh, remember the spike protein is that which attaches to the uh, cell uh, in order for the virus to gain entry into the cell. So this particular DNA is packaged into an adenovirus. The adenovirus is, uh, causes uh, common cold or flu-like symptoms. Uh, but the adenovirus is an unusual adenovirus uh, that actually comes from a chimpanzee, not, not from humans. But it can't really infect us because all the guts of the virus does not exist inside the package, just the DNA of the COVID uh, virus. And similarly, once it's injected um, and gets inside a, uh, a cell, uh, the DNA is unpackaged. It's uh, trans, uh, transcribed into mRNA, and then the mRNA is trans translated into actually a spike protein, which then we make uh, a, an immune response, both an antibody response and a cell-mediated immune response. And then the uh, the other vaccine is Novavax, which is a Maryland-based uh, company, and uh, their vaccine is a little bit different. It's a protein-based uh, coronavirus vaccine, again, to the uh, uh, spike, uh, uh, spike protein, and uh, <clears throat> this virus is in, uh, uh, it's, it's still in clinical trials, but uh, we expect it to come along uh, perhaps in March or April. It remains to be seen how, you know, how fast this uh, goes through the phase three trials. And this is just gives you a little bit of schematic of what, you know, how this protein-based vaccines actually work from, uh, from this particular manufacturer. Um, they actually, uh, 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 this uh, uh, spike protein, they, they package it and uh, deliver it with an adjuvant, which is in the bottom part of the, of the slide. And this kind of boosts up the immune system. So we make a, a really good response, uh, again, both humoral and cellular. And uh, with this vaccine, unlike some of the other vaccines, this may only require one injection and not two. Okay, so let's go to some of the common questions that, uh, that the IDF received through the portal. And a frequent question is, what about COVID in patients with primary immune deficiency disease? And uh, we didn't know very much about it when I presented this forum, I guess, back in October. Uh, but we have, we have some published papers now that just uh, came out. Uh, the first paper actually came out in July of, of uh, 2020 in our journal, Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, uh, from Dr. Quinty in Italy. As you know, uh, Europe early on was a hot spot, particularly Italy. So she reported on seven patients, not very many, very small study, five with common variable immunodeficiency, two with X-linked agammoglobinemia, and it turned out, again, it's a very small study that the patients with XLA had very mild disease, whereas those with CVID had more severe disease, particularly with pneumonia. Now, the caveat here is that many of these patients with common variable immunodeficiency had underlying other disorders. They may have had chronic lung disease. Uh, <clears throat> they may have had autoimmunity, uh, et cetera you know, or lymph, lymphocyte proliferative uh, abnormalities. Um, so we think like the general population that puts them more at risk. Now, Dr. Cohen in New York City uh, just published in January of 2020 his, their studies and they had 135 patients, not with COVID, with uh, CVID, that's my typo. So they had 135 patients with common variable immune deficiency. In their group, only 10 had COVID disease. Most of them were mild. Only one was hospitalized and there was one death. Again, um, uh, the more uh, severe outcome was related to underlying comorbid conditions, just like the general population. The next slide is a very large population. It's actually an international uh, study from all over the world where they collected uh, all sorts of primary immune deficiency diseases, uh, as it says, inborn areas of immunity. 
they had 94 patients. You can see the breakdown, 56% had primary antibody deficiency, about 10% had immune dysregulation, 6% of phagocytic defect, like chronic granulomas disease is an example there. 7% uh, had auto-inflammatory uh, disorder and 50% had a combined immunodeficiency. That is, they had abnormalities of both T cell and antibody production. And you can see on the next line that 10% were asymptomatic, 27% were treated as outpatients, 30% by simple admission, maybe they uh, just were in the hospital for a few days, 14% required oxygen and admitted to the ICU and 10% died. So the 10% is, again, is about what we see in the general population. And uh, the more severe outcome uh, of patients in the ICU, uh, as far as morbidity and the mortality, again, was related to the fact that many of those patients had underlying uh, comorbid conditions, they were older. Uh, and again, very similar to the general population that I'm sure you're familiar with because the CDC has you know, put this out uh, in the media a number of times. So uh, just to summarize those first two slides, I think, um, you know, I think it's a positive that uh, in general, patients with primary immune deficiency uh, seem to not be at increased risk for morbidity and mortality from COVID and less, unless they have underlying uh, conditions that compromise their health. As I said, chronic uh, lung disease, uh, uh, lymphoproliferative uh, disorders, uh, kidney disease, uh, and even you know, those that may have uh, cancer like lymphoma. So another common question I get, should we use these COVID vaccines in patients with PI? And uh, you know, we don't have any data on this. This is, this is all uh, uh, from the Clinical Immunology Society uh, listserv. So this is all opinion. And the opinion by experts throughout the world is that we should give our patients the vaccine. We know they're not gonna respond as well as uh, the, the general population. Uh, but even if they make some antibody and if they make a cellular immune response, we think that that's great. And, and therefore the general recommendation is to give these vaccines. Uh, you can see there's one very rare <clears throat> subgroup where there is some hesitancy in giving the vaccine, uh, the mRNA vaccine, but uh, there was just a listserv uh, email the other day where someone with STAT1 uh, received an mRNA vaccine and they did fine. There was no, no complications at all. And I don't anticipate any issues with the DNA vaccines uh, either. Uh, maybe Dr. Walter can comment on uh, <clears throat> her thoughts uh, later in the Q&A section about this topic. So can a person actually create antibodies? Um, and we, we know from influenza vaccine, because this is an area that actually uh, studied, is that many of our patients with PI can actually make specific antibodies and actually make a T cell response. So even the patients with common variable immunodeficiency uh, can make a, uh, an immune response. Now, obviously patients with XLA, X-linked agammaglobinemia, are not gonna make antibodies, but they're gonna make a T cell response and you know, we hope that that may provide at least some immunity uh, to change the, uh, the severity of the uh, COVID infection. And as I pointed out before, in uh, the Italian study, the two patients with XLA actually did quite well. And in the international study, the patients with, uh, many of the patients with antibody deficiency, including XLA, also did quite well. Um, so <clears throat> another common question we get is does the, um, um, well, so that's, that's in the next slide. So we'll probably have a lot more data about the response of our PI patients with, to the COVID vaccines. It's going to take some time. I'm estimating it may take another nine months before we get some reports in the literature. 
So should a person get a vaccine if they're on immunoglobulin therapy? Well, first of all, the COVID vaccines are not live viral vaccines. So, you know, we all know that we, you know, we shouldn't mix live viral vaccines in getting immunoglobulin replacement therapy because the antibodies in the IVIG or subcutaneous IG can inactivate the live viral vaccines, but these are not live viral vaccines. So we can probably give it any time after the vaccine. I had suggested maybe two weeks after a patient with PI gets a vaccine, they can you know, get their replacement uh, aminoglobulin uh, therapy. First of all, the aminoglobulin that's currently in the market does not have specific antibodies uh, to the COVID-19 um, uh, virus, doesn't have antibodies to the spike protein, for example. It takes nine months for a batch of gamma globulin to be produced by a manufacturer. So let's see, the first exposure, uh, maybe March, April, when the pandemic was just gearing up uh, in the United States, uh, where uh, prospective plasmapheresis donors, you know, may have some antibody. Uh, so we're looking at uh, probably late 2021 or 2022. So, so this is a question for everyone. Can you spread the COVID-19 after you get vaccinated? And I believe the current CDC recommendations is that we still should be cognizant of the COVID-19 precautions, social distancing, good hand washing, wearing masks. And I've heard Dr. Fauci say this actually today uh, on his news conference. And, um, you know, so the question is, when can we return to normal? Uh, he was asked that question today and he said, hopefully by the fall, if we can get 85% of individuals uh, vaccinated. We do know that asymptomatic individuals can spread the virus. In fact, during this pandemic, uh, roughly a quarter of the infections that we experience are actually spread during the asymptomatic phase of somebody who gets infected. So if you get the vaccine, uh, you know, we, we know what the efficacy is, that we know these individuals do quite well but they may still have an asymptomatic viral infection. Uh, and although they won't get sick, they may potentially still be able to spread the virus. We don't know this for sure. We, we don't have the data, but it's out there as a, as a possibility. And finally, I, another thing I wanna stress, uh, we have these two monoclonal antibody cocktails one from Eli Lilly and the other from Regeneron. The Regeneron actually has two monoclonal antibodies, very highly potent specific against the spike protein. And it's approved by the FDA. And it's there in hospitals and it's sitting on the shelves. So I implore you to work with your physician, your allergist, immunologist, to um, know beforehand how to get enrolled to uh, obtain these monoclonal antibody cocktails uh, because uh, there's a time factor here. You have to administer these cocktails uh, within uh, 10 days of symptom onset and a positive uh, viral uh, COVID-19 test. So you have this window when the efficacy is very, very high uh, with these monoclonal antibodies. So I think it, it's uh, really your responsibility to discuss this with your, either your primary care provider, your allergist immunologist, your clinical immunologist, so that if you do come down with COVID-19 test positive and have early symptoms, you can, uh, uh, seek this uh, therapy, which is mainly being administered in a hospital setting, nowhere else, as far as my understanding, it's in the hospital setting. So it, it does very well to, you know, to plan ahead. That's, seek, that's the secret, plan ahead. And that's my last slide, Ashley.
It is indeed, Dr. Bala. Thank you so much. At this time, I would now like to invite Dr. Yolan Walter uh, to give a quick presentation. Hello, Dr. Walter. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And this is sort of a cherry on the top of Dr. Bello's amazing presentation. He is, has a long standing interest in COVID-19 and he has been educating our fellowship program and all of us on COVID-19. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of data from Florida where we are. And as you know, Florida has been heavily affected by COVID-19. So we started to look at our patient population a bit closer. And uh, I'm gonna share with you a, a short abstract that we presented on one of our research day <clears throat> and will be presented at the Quad AI. <clears throat> so this is basically a little study when you would like to look at how our patients are faring um, in our institution since Florida is one of the highest, has one of the highest numbers of COVID-19 cases. We were looking at patients regarding the demographics, symptoms, diagnosis, comor comorbidities, medications. Uh, and the patients who were enrolled to this study were either infected with the virus or had direct exposure through household contact. And then uh, we either used a viral nucleic acid or an antibody test to confirm their infection. So, we had a similar objective and hypothesis than um, what has been actually shown recently in the papers. We felt that probably our immunodeficient patients, especially the pediatric and young adult patients, will do well during the COVID-19 pandemic as long as they are on maintenance therapy, immunoglobulin replacement, and proper immune modulation. And to sort of test this idea, we reviewed their medical history, and again, these patients were either positive for COVID um, infection, um, exposure, or had at least a contact. So what we find at, as of October of 2020, and since then we probably even doubled our cases, but we don't have that full data set ready yet, is that we had 18 patients in our cohort who were exposed or had infections, and around 60% of them had allergic condition, and half of them had antibody deficiency. We only had at that time one patient who had very low T cell count and another one with immunodeficiency who was actually untreated. The median age um, of this symptomatic patient was uh, 12 years of age and uh, was, was actually 18 years of age and there was a similar male and female ratio and when we looked at their distribution, whether they had to stay at home only or went to the emergency room or the hospital, it was quite divided equally. 30% stayed at home, 30% went to the, the emergency room and 30% become hospitalized. And as I'm looking at Dr. Bellow's slides uh, from the paper of Isabella Meis in, in Europe, of their 94 patient experience, it was a very similar ratio when 30% of the patients were outpatient, 30% had a very simple admission, and 30% went to the ICU or got a higher level of care. And again, of those 18 patients who either had an infection or exposure, only six of them had antibody testing positivity, uh, uh, antibody testing, and three of them were actually positive of the six. So it sort of tells you that um, antibody testing may not be fully reliable in our population since we all know that our immune deficient patients have difficulty making the proper amount uh, or quality of antibodies. Their exposure or even infections may not be reflected properly on the IgG antibody levels. So basically what we also saw is that those patients who actually got hospitalized had significant comorbidities including asthma and obesity in the pediatric population. And none of our patients required respiratory support or died. And uh, we also saw that those patients uh, who did very well, they were following their immunoglobulin replacement treatment plan. They had good um, immune modulation if they had inflammatory conditions. And our overall hospitalization rate for our population was similar to the general population in Florida. So in conclusion, um, in our young adult population right here in Florida, we know that they can get infected. Some of them will be symptomatic, 
but we are only truly concerned or very, very concerned among those, uh, for those who have comorbidities, asthma, obesity, and especially those who have uncontrolled inflammatory disease. Therefore, uh, we do emphasize for our patients to make sure that they maintain immunosuppressive medications and they have good immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Of course, we don't know uh, what will determine some of these patients' um, infectivity and disease severity, and there are other studies that are needed in that regard. I'm really glad to see all these publications coming out as of January of this year, and I'm sure that there will be more coming in the coming months. So this is just a little bit of um, um, sort of helping you to understand where we are going in science in understanding what is happening in our patient population. We really would like to know what exactly is happening in the immune response uh, regarding the immune response in our patients. And for that, we got a little grant from the hospital and many of the doctors that we work with um, in rheumatology and other specialties are going to be in this funding. And basically what we wanted to look here is what kind of quality of antibody response happens in our patient. Dr. Bello has nicely presented to us that uh, immune deficient patient may have a problem with proper IgG antibody response and may rely on other like cellular or innate responses to fight up the infection. So um, we wanted to understand what is the degree of risk of the infection and the underlying condition? And what is the correlation between the quality of the antibody, the effectiveness of the antibody and the disease outcome in our patient population? So our hypothesis in this study is that we think that patients who have an underlying immune deficiency or immunosuppressing medications may not have the best quality antibody response and therefore we will look for these patients who had exposure, test their antibody positivity, and look for the quality by the ability of the antibody to neutralize or kill the virus and how long these antibodies are, are sustained. And the significance of this study will be that um, we hopefully will be able to draw certain conclusions for our immune deficient patient populations or who is at risk who may not be able to fight up infections properly, who would really need additional support or very close monitoring when they have an infection. So this is a study that will be launched soon and uh, we are very excited to enroll patients from our population here at All Children's or through referrals so we can look at the quality of antibody response. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much, Dr. Ballow and Dr. Walter. We appreciate your presentations, uh, very informative. A reminder to our audience, if you have any questions, please do submit them via ask, I'm sorry, via the chat so that we can get those answered during our live Q&A. I would now like to pass it to Eric Fluckhorn for Octa Pharma for a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks, Ashley. Hi, everybody. I'm Eric Fluckhorn from Octa Pharma. And we're happy to be able to help support these continuing uh, IDF forums. And it's super surprising to see that we still have, you know, more than 500 attendees after almost a, a year of doing these. But it's also refreshing to get such good presentations tonight from, from Dr. Walter and Dr. Ballow. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in the breakout rooms. I'm joined tonight by Laurel Cherwin, who's one of our clinical nurse educators, and a zebra herself. And we really want to spend time tonight to make sure that we uh, listen to your questions and can address any, uh, any questions you might have about uh, our products or Octopharm or any of the support services we have for them. So thanks. We'll see you all soon. Thank you so much, Eric. And at this time, I would now like to invite Sean McCabe from Takeda for a quick word from our sponsors. Hi, Sean. Hi. And I'll, I'll echo the same thanks that Eric just provided. Uh, Sean McCabe, I have the honor and the privilege of leading our immune deficiency franchise here at Takeda. Uh, we're also the proud manufacturers of uh, GammaGuard, Hycuvia, and Cuvitru. Um, we're not here to talk product tonight. I say it all the time. We're here to listen and learn and most importantly, support you in any way. And just a, a hello, a happy new year to everyone. Dr. Ballo, Dr. Walter, thank you so much for the, uh, the very relevant apropos insights. Um, not only is it really sound uh, scientific, but also just provides hope. And in the spirit of that, we hope we can be able to better serve all of you in this coming year. So looking forward to that. 
Uh, in the breakouts, I'll be joined by Dana Flathammer, who leads our uh, community support team. So we look forward to addressing any questions that you may have. And uh, again, thank you. And uh, finally, a huge kudos to the IDF, just reflecting back on 2020 and an amazing amount of forums and education and connection delivered. So thank you again as well. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And we definitely look forward to seeing you in the virtual uh, breakout hall. So at this time, we are going to go ahead and get into our Q&A session. We have received quite a few questions. So we're going to go through as many questions as we can during this time. Uh, a quick disclaimer now, if we are unable to get to your question, uh, please do submit your question to Ask IDF. One of my colleagues will put in a link in the chat box. Um, but again, we are going to try to get through as many as we can right now. Uh, so with that, the first question that I would like to ask Dr. Ballo and uh, Dr. Walter, can you please explain what the viral vector platform is that is being used to create the COVID vaccines and is it harmful to people with PI? Uh, the, the viral vector platform is an adenoviral, adenovirus package. It's, it's an adenovirus that's not common in humans. In fact, it's very unusual in humans, as I mentioned before, but they take the, uh, the, the guts of the, um, you know, the, the regenerative uh, material out of the virus, the, actually the DNA out of the virus, so it can't replicate. It's just, in, it's just a shell of the virus that allows it to penetrate into the cell. Um, but what they do is they, uh, they take the DNA of the COVID virus and package it inside the shell of the, uh, the viral vector, uh, in this case, the adenovirus. Thank you, Dr. Ballo. Um, how does the vaccine work on people with IgG and IgA deficiencies compared to other PIs? Is there, are there any special considerations? Yolan, why don't you answer that? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. As we know that any type of infection uh, that we have would benefit from a proper IgA and IgG response. So the, the question is when you have both or none, or can you just clarify that further? Do I have to distinguish IgG from IgA or just in general? Uh, just in general, please. Mm -hmm. So IgG is a, our systemic antibody response. IgA is more on the mucosal surfaces. And if you don't have them, of course, it would be a, a difficult task to fully control the viral infection. But luckily we still have T cells and innate cells to do some of the job. So because of that, we, have, we did notice that patients with full absence of immunoglobulin, such as the XLA group that Dr. Bello mentioned, did quite well with COVID-19. So what, what it says to us is that even if it is a very important measure of protection to have IgG and IgA, if the rest of the immune system works properly, the T cells and the NK cells and the innate cells, then the patients can actually do well with controlling the virus. So it's a risk factor, but it's not something that uh, you must have to control the viral infection. Thank you. What is the risk of developing, developing ITP from the vaccine? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, negligible. Uh, I'm not aware uh, in any of the clinical trials uh, that uh, there has been any discussion about inducing uh, uh, autoimmune disease like ITP. How long might a patient need to wait after the second dose of the vaccine to check titers? We generally wait uh, in, in, in regular circumstances, three to four weeks after we vaccinate to check titers. So I would say at least three weeks, ideally four weeks to check titers. Perfect. And is, are there any specific tests that an immunologist should run in order to see if an individual who's received the vaccine has had a good response? Uh, no, I, 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 I guess you could you know, order antibodies. First of all, I have to look this up and I don't know if any of the present uh, commercial labs actually quantitate the antibody. It may be, uh, you know, they tell you that you're that you have IgG and IgM, uh, 
uh, there to the uh, to the spike protein. Uh, but in the clinical trials, you know, it's a totally different story because it's a clinical trial. So therefore, they actually, uh, you know, they they carefully uh, quantitate uh, the, the virus, and they also qualitate the virus because they look at the ability of the of the uh, IgG in the, in the person to neutralize the virus. So that you're not going to get from a commercial lab, at least presently. Uh, but the commercial lab will tell you, you know, whether IgG and IgM antibodies are present. Can I just make a point on this, Mark? Sure. You know, this is my pet peeve. So this is exactly what Dr. Bello was mentioning, that we don't really know what means protection. Having an IgG, does it truly mean that you will be fully protected is unclear because the threshold of protection has not been fully defined. So it's good to have the IgG antibody. We are happy when we see that. But if is the patient fully protected, it's still unclear to us. So that's sort of a, a difficult topic to fully resolve at this point. Thank you. Um, what happens if the vaccine gets warm? Can you get sick if the vaccine is not cold enough? Well, I think all these vaccine uh, centers that are administering the vaccine are very careful to control the, te the temperatures. Uh, you're not gonna get sick if, if that happens, I think, the worst case scenario, the vaccine is going to be less, uh, you know, less efficacious in, in inducing an immune response. It'll be at work less well. But I, I assume all of these vaccine centers are very, very careful in how they handle the vaccine. Thank you. Um, as XLA patients can't produce antibodies due to the lack of mature B cells, are there benefits of mRNA vaccines for these type of patients? This is a, a very interesting question because people tend to get stuck at the RNA question. But what happens with the messenger RNA, as he showed, is that this RNA will actually be introduced to the muscle cells where it will be translated to a protein. So literally the me messenger RNA is just a vehicle to really make that protein right in your body. And it's not gonna be any different in that sense from a typical protein vaccine, because in the end, you need the protein for the immune system to recognize it and to make a response to it. So in that sense, messenger RNA versus protein vaccines are interchangeable regarding how the immunogenicity will be evoked. Thank you. Uh, a question uh, from a few of our patients. So some of our patients uh, suffer from allergic reactions to flu and pneumonia vaccines, and as a result are not able to get the current vaccine. Is there a possibility that nasal sprays will be available as an option uh, for COVID and when might these be available? What, what, what might be available? I didn't catch that, Ashley. Uh, nasal sprays as a uh, treatment for COVID. Actually, actually, they uh, there is in a phase one trial now. Um, they're working on an oral vaccine uh, to COVID, uh, and also a nasal spray vaccine as well. These are very very early on in phase one trials, and so you know it's gonna it's gonna take six months or longer to you know to get through the phase three trial to show efficacy but they are working on that. Can I have a comment on the allergy piece for a minute? So interestingly, this vaccine is not like the other vaccines that you may be allergic to, because in this vaccine, um, the components that are re really creating the allergy is called PEG, P-E-G. And sometimes patients get allergic to other vaccines for other reasons. So I think you always have to talk to your allergist about like what was exactly why you were allergic to a previous vaccine and is there really an overlap with of that with the current vaccine. So I think that's very important that you discuss it with your allergist and don't just assume that you are allergic to all vaccines. Thank you. Uh, is there a possibility that individuals with PI will need to be revaccinated every year or so in order to protect themselves? There may be a possibility for the general population to be revaccinated every year or so. Uh, we don't know yet. It's too too early to, to tell. And when would 
when would there be a possibility of knowing what that revaccination time frame would look like if it is the case? Well, the individuals that were in the phase three trial, they're going to follow them, uh, you know, way out to, to follow their antibody responses and their T cell responses, you know, to see if they maintain those uh, uh, levels. Again, as Dr. Walter said, you know, at present time, we don't know what the threshold level is of the specific antibody to the spike protein that actually is important to protect us. But maybe going forward, we'll, we'll have more of that information. Thank you. Um, what might make an individual with PI at higher risk of a reaction to one of the COVID vaccines? In my mind, actually, mastal disorder patients are probably the highest risk for getting an, a non-specific allergic reaction to the vaccine. And we have patients who have immune deficiency, antibody deficiency, and possibly mast cell related disorders. So I would warn them to, to make sure that they talk to their allergists and immunologists before they go for the vaccine. And, um, and there's really no other immune deficiency that would make you more prone for allergy to the vaccine. Actually having a low active immune system is probably going to be a bit of a benefit of not getting an allergic reaction. Thank you. Um, are vaccines available for children under the age 16? No. They're, in study. They're in study right now. Um, I don't remember which, maybe the Moderna vaccine now is doing a, a study in, in children. Uh, and I think the Johnson & Johnson vaccine may be also in, uh, being studied in children, but that's, at the present time, uh, the answer is no. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> will the vaccine be enough for a person with PI to protect themselves or do they still need to do other things to keep themselves safe during the pandemic? Do you want to go for it, Mark? <laughs> I can see you. No, I mean, I mean not uh, you can fill in, but as I said before, we still must practice the basics. Of course, we're in a pandemic wearing a mask, social distancing, distancing good hand washing. Uh, you know, uh, this comes right from the top, Dr. Fauci. So do you wanna to add to that, Yolan? No, I, I fully agree. I think it's very important that we don't let our guards down. And it's so easy sometimes to think about it that we are vaccinated now and we can go about our life. But uh, unfortunately, the rate of infection is way too high and we could easily be transmitters of the disease or get infected ourselves. Thank you. Uh, my primary care provider has expressed concerns about the effect that activating mRNA might have on autoimmune conditions. Is this a valid concern? I am not aware of any uh, issues with the mRNA vaccine and reactivating autoimmune diseases. Um, I, I, I don't know for a fact, but I assume in the phase three trial, there were maybe uh, some individuals in that trial that had some uh, autoimmunity. Uh, and uh, I'm not aware of, of anything in the literature that suggests that it may, that it may be a, a problem. Um, I think the also colitis society and some of the other autoimmune societies are, are recommending the vaccine to their, uh, to their patients. Thank you. Um, is there any data yet to suggest that one vaccine will be better for PI patients than the other? Is one vaccine more likely, for example, to make a T cell response rather than an antibody response? No, there's no data yet. Uh, all the vaccines uh, uh, that are approved thus far seem to make a very robust antibody as well as a T cell response. So, uh, so we don't really know the answer to that. Now, maybe we will nine months from now when we have more uh, patients with PI being immunized and we have the data from those individuals. The other unfortunate thing is that we really can't measure T cell responses yet clinically. 
So we only rely on antibody response, which I don't think is the full picture. And ideally, it would be great to have a T-cell T -cell proliferation assay or lymphocyte proliferation assay to this antigen to show that your T-cells actually have seen it and they are ready to go. And maybe at some point, they will develop that. Is there a sense of when we can expect IVIG or SEIG to reach a high enough level of COVID protection? 2022. But we don't know if it's going to be high enough because, again, we don't know what the threshold antibody level needs to be in order to protect someone with passive antibody, passive administration of antibodies. What is recommended for those who have had multiple autoimmune issues or have had issues with a stimulating immune system? This is a, an important question and it, it seems to come back again and again. Um, we did discuss in our presentation how immune dysregulation can be a risk factor for infection and possibly worsen the infection itself. So if you think about having more symptoms in the infection, if you get immunized, you probably could have more symptoms as well. So those individuals who have um, history of uncontrolled immune dysregulation um, or rheumatological disease could expect that any type of immunization can make them a little bit more reactive to the vaccine, but I would not call it allergic. I would not call it like, you know, severe inflammation. So I think there is some uh, risk coming with it and controlling the inflammatory disease is always the way to go. Um, occasionally for those, maybe even pre-medications could be useful and that's something that they can discuss with their physician. The other variable is that, you know, patients who have underlying autoimmune disorders uh, may be on uh, biologics that actually suppress the immune system. And uh, that has not been studied at all in, with these vaccines. Um, but for example, if somebody is on rituximab, which knocks out the B cells, uh, which certainly is, you know, a common biologic used in a variety of autoimmune procedures, then, you know, we wouldn't expect that individual to make a, an, at least an antibody response to the vaccine, although they may make a cellular response. So it's, it's complicated and we don't have all the answers yet. Uh, I think, you know, it remains to be seen uh, how the data comes out in the general population that has autoimmune disorders, either GI, hematologic, endocrine, uh, uh, rheumatologic, et cetera. So maybe in another six months, we may have more information. How will people with PI who take IgG therapies have their antibodies measured if they are regularly getting other people's antibodies via plasma? So we already discussed it that we don't think that there is a fair amount of COVID specific or SARS-2 COVID specific antibodies in the current plasma specimens. Therefore, it would not really uh, mask your own antibodies since they're not in the plasma at this point as they're gonna increase if the amount of antibody to, um, to the virus will increase in the plasma supplies, then, then it could be an issue that you may not know whether you make it or not, but not at this time. Is there a certain amount of time that an individual with PI uh, needs to wait between their infusions to receive the vaccine before or after? Yeah, uh, obviously we don't have it. We don't have any information or data on that. I've been telling patients if they're on IVIG getting a monthly, I would do it, you know, like in between, like two weeks after. Uh, but if somebody is on frequent subcutaneous, uh, that makes it more difficult. I don't think they should withhold their uh, immunoglobulin replacement therapy because it protects them from infection. And as I've said before, I don't expect the immunoglobulin replacement therapy to damage the vaccine or neutralize the vaccine. What risks do people that have a low B cell count have on the flow cytometry in COVID? Um, I'm not aware of any flow cytometry method for COVID. 
Uh, COVID is actually currently the virus is diagnosed by PCR, which is um, more like um, an RNA DNA based assay and also an, um, an antibody assay. So there is no full cytometry aspect of COVID-19 infection detection. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, can you explain whether or not the, vac the COVID vaccine is a live vaccine and whether a patient should talk more with their immunologist about which vaccine is best for them? None of the none of the COVID vaccines are live vaccines. So that's that's it's not an issue. None of them are live. Thank you. Um, I have CVID with several underlying conditions, mostly related with digestion, but not pneumonia or other respiratory conditions. Will this impact my ability to be vaccinated? No. Are there certain um, PIs, certain diagnosis that patients will need to consider before getting di uh, vaccinated? In other words, are they not going to be able to get vaccinated because of their diagnosis? Dr. Bello had an excellent slide on um, the current expert opinion. And there are certain immune disorders where you have a problem with overexpression of, of certain substances that cause inflammation in your body. We call them interferonopathies, including STAT1, uh, gain of function um, variants and other disorders. So if you have a highly inflammatory immune deficiency from that category, then you would have um, a problem possibly. But otherwise, am I correct, Mark? Yeah, I mean, again, this is all theoretical. Uh, they talked about the interferonopathies too, the individuals who have defects in the interferon pathway. But, you know, this is all speculation. There was no data on this. And as I said, on the listserv, one of the physicians said that he did give the vaccine to somebody with STAT1 and they, they did fine. They had no, no adverse effects. If a patient had COVID, became extremely sick and hospitalized, but recovered, this is an individual with PI, should they get vaccinated? And if so, is there a waiting period before they should get vaccinated? This is a very interesting and important question. I don't think we know the answer to it yet, but uh, the fact that somebody got the infection and uh, was hospitalized means that it took them longer to fight up the infection. So maybe their quality of antibody response is a little bit suboptimal. Um, there are some data now from healthy individuals who got hospitalized. It turned out that their antibody titers got much, much higher than those who just get normal infections. But it doesn't mean that actually the quality of the antibody response was strong or good. So we do say that even if you had the, the, the infection, um, you should consider revaccinating yourself. And I would probably recommend it um, maybe weeks after the true infection, since there could be some uh, possible cross reactivity of antibodies. But again, everything is sort of unknown. So there are no clear guidelines and no full understanding. Mark, any other? I, I, think this, I think the CDC came out with recommendations and I think they, uh, the recommendations, I'd, I'd have to look at it for sure again, but I think the recommendations, yes, if you've had COVID-19, you should get vaccinated. Uh, you should wait at least two weeks after resolution of the symptoms. Okay, and I, I assume that's the case, uh, just to make sure that if you have any adverse effects from the vaccine, you, can, you don't mix it up from, you know, from the symptoms of the COVID. Uh, so I think that's the CDC. Anyone can get on the CDC site and verify that. I think you're uh, right, Mark. We discussed it in one of our runs. Thank you. Uh, in regards to the CDC guidelines, so for COVID-19 vaccine distribution, the CDC has people with immune deficiencies considered in a category different from those who are immunocompromised. Why is that, or why do you think that might be? 
I don't know, maybe that's something the IDF can work on, John. Because um, there are there are some states that are vaccinating individuals under age 65 who have underlying comorbid conditions. So, um, you, know, uh, you, you know, you would think that PI would be in that category as well. But uh, I think that's something that we may have to look into. It's funny. Uh just to break in since you uh, uh, called on me here, uh, with part of our Protecting the Immunocompromised uh, Coalition or uh, Collaborative, I should say, we're trying to explore um, and, and frankly get, if you will, better guidance on that as time goes on because the, the immunocompromise is the phrase that tends to be used. And yet uh, those uh, who are in remission with cancer, uh, those who are dealing with HIV AIDS, those who have autoimmune only situations, uh, the, the way in which one is immunocompromised and the reaction to things like vaccines there's some real variation. So at some level, we need to, yes, uh, uh, have better and different language. And hopefully uh, with, uh, with new, uh, new folks going into the CDC, uh, and again, everyone knowing more about COVID, we'll have an opportunity to really delve deeper into that area. Because in the past, uh, they've been painting with a rather broad brush, I would say, more often than not. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dr. Ballo. Thank you, Dr. Walter. Unfortunately, that does bring us to the end of our Q&A session. Uh, we, we received probably over 200 questions, so we know that there were a lot there. Thank you to everyone for participating. Again, if your question was not answered, we do ask that you please submit your question via Ask IDF. One of my colleagues has submitted the, a link in our chat so that you can do that. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Ballo. Thank you, Dr. Walter, for being here with us. We appreciate your time, especially with how crazy the world is right now. It always means a lot to us. Um, at this time, I would like to, again, offer thanks to our sponsors for uh, helping us put on these forums, being able to provide you with these opportunities to ask questions. At this time, I would now like to welcome back our president and CEO, John Boyle, for some closing remarks. And thank you, everyone. It's all yours, John. Thanks, Ashley, and thank you, uh, everyone, for being here, especially to our uh, two presenters, Drs. Uh, Ballo and Walter. Uh, that was phenomenal, and as I was uh, texting uh, with, the, with Dr. Walter, I mean, what a great tag team. Uh, it, the, the, the collegiality and the support of the medical uh, uh, community that really focuses on us uh, is something else, and, and please do note, they donate their time to be with us here tonight. So uh, do, uh, do, do thank them whenever you see them in person at one of our events uh, down the line and just know that we're so grateful to have their expertise as well as so many others who've been helping us. I do just want to uh, express my jealousy uh, of uh, the raffle winners. I saw that the IDF mask is something uh, that is, uh, is a prize now. Um, I don't have one of those. Even, even with signing the checks and things like that, I don't get access to that. So you guys are getting truly exclusive access and are, are the, the, lucky, uh, the lucky dogs here. Um, and so that's the fun of taking part in this and staying to the very end. You get all the exclusive swag. Um, I do wanna just say that uh, in addition to, to hoping that uh, you all learned a lot from our presenters. Uh, my colleagues and I learned a fair bit from you. There were, um, uh, uh, we were all taking some notes as to some areas where there's obviously a lot of questions, maybe even, uh, even some confusion or more information uh, that people do want to know about that really goes into some more deep dives, um, you know, that, that'll help us to figure out where as the months go on, more of these forums uh, need to address. So please, uh, you know, we learn as much from you as hopefully you do from our uh, uh, presenters. And just know that we create these forums and all of our programming to make sure that you feel informed, empowered, and can talk with your care team, uh, you know, about the things uh, that will hopefully help bring a little bit of certainty to uh, to uncertain times. So um, that's it for those of you who have not yet had dinner, please go and eat, uh, get the blood sugar up. Uh, really delighted to have you as part of this. Uh, we have, uh, as you can see, um, you know, on uh, January 28th, uh, another uh, great uh, forum lined up, especially for those of you who are parents. Uh, and uh, just know that we will try to continue to mix things up to hit all the different facets uh, of the, uh, the the PI community here because we are all zebras. We have different stripes, but uh, you know we do have some 
of those uh, the, the, those stripes uh, that are facing similar directions. So we'll try to make sure that we provide something for everyone as time goes on. And I just thank you for being here. And I hope that you all stay safe, encourage your loved ones and those around you to wear their masks, to be vigilant. These are uh, some really uh, unnerving times that we're going through right now. Um, but I know that you all uh, are, are better prepared than most to weather the storm, uh, but just know that all of us at IDF are here for you uh, in any way, shape, and form that we can help. So with that, good night, and thanks so much for being with us.